Good evening, friends. My name is Pat Mannon. I am joined tonight by Brother Ben Soto, and together we are coming to you live from Northwest Arkansas. We are so delighted to be with you. We're so glad to have you with us. <clears throat> we've been uh, delayed in a study that we've been doing on the use of instrumental music in worship. About three Wednesdays ago, we began this study and did part one. And uh, our intention was to come back the following week, of course, and finish up the study. But some illness has uh, hampered that. and <clears throat> We simply weren't able to do it. So we've had to delay a couple of Wednesdays. And now we're glad to be back with you and have the opportunity to do part two. Since there's been quite an interval between the first study and this one, We'll certainly go back and <clears throat> recap the things that we taught during the first study, uh, make sure that everybody uh, has a good basic understanding of those things that we've covered. Now, you can go back and watch that video, of course, and you can uh, get the uh, full body of the teaching, and we hope you'll do that if you need to, and do that as many times as you need to. But uh, we'll recap that for you tonight before we start in on the second part. Uh, we introduced our thoughts in part number one from uh, John chapter 4 and verse 19 through 24. Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well near the Samaritan city of Sychar. And um, the Lord has stopped there, he and the disciples, They've gone into the city to buy bread. In the meanwhile, he is tired. He is weary. It's hot, dusty country. He's been traveling. It is noonday. The sun probably in all of its splendor is shining upon him. And he sat on the well. It's a deep well. He has nothing to draw with. So he can't get a drink, but he's very thirsty. There comes a Samaritan woman to this well she walks a half a mile from the Samaritan city of Sychar out to the well to draw water, which she will carry back to the city. And she does this frequently, perhaps daily, maybe several times a day. We do not know, depending on how much water she needs. Nonetheless, the Lord is sitting there when she approaches. And uh, he, he engages her in a conversation. He asks her for a drink. That makes her mad because she's a Samaritan, and Jews and Samaritans don't have any dealings. And so she wonders, why are you asking me? You Jews don't want anything to do with us now. Now that you're thirsty, you'll ask me for a drink. And so she starts a religious argument with him, basically, and in verse 19, it really begins to intensify. She says, or the record says this, but John, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I raised the question after we read this verse, does it really make any difference how we worship God? And the answer is yes. Jesus said in verse 23 and 24, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, notice, true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, the woman had a convoluted idea about God. She thought that God might be confined to a particular place if you were going to worship. The fathers had worshipped there under those mountains. She refers back specifically to Abraham, even back to uh, Jacob, even back to the days of Joshua, and uh, to the fact that the fathers worshipped back here 
right at this particular place. And so it was an old traditional place. Now she said, you Jews come along telling us that we have to worship in Jerusalem. You see, Solomon had built a temple there, and uh, all of a sudden that became the worship center of the Jews because that's what God wanted, of course. And so <clears throat> to argue about the place. What Jesus shows her is that God's not confined to a place. God is a spirit. <coughs> confined to a temple. He's not confined to a mountain. He's not confined to the city of Jerusalem. Jesus says that the hour comes when you'll neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, we talked about in spirit and in truth, didn't we? We talked about what constituted true worship. To worship in spirit means from the heart. To worship in truth means according to the word of God. Those two ingredients have to be in any act of worship that we do. If we offer God singing, or prayers, or the Lord's Supper, whatever we're doing in worship to God, it has to come in spirit. That is, it has to come out of our hearts. We have to mean what we're doing. Secondly, it has to be according to the Word of God. That is, we have to have authority from God's Word for what we offer God. And if the act that we're offering God is not found in Scripture, if it's not found in his word, then we have no authority to give it to God. We have, a, we have presumed to do that. And God is not pleased when we take it upon ourselves to decide what we will give him because he has the right to demand of us those things that he wants in worship to him. See, And so after all, he is God. The true worshiper will worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus said the Father seeks such to worship him. That God's a spirit and they that worship him, that is, they that worship him acceptably, must worship him in spirit and in truth from the heart and according to his word. And then we looked at vain worship because in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, Jesus talked about the worship of the Jews. And Christ said of the Jews, Matthew 15, 8 and 9, he said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So he talked about how the Jews failed in their worship. They drew nigh to God with the mouth, and they honored him with the lips but their heart was far from him. They said a lot of beautiful things to God, but they really didn't come from the heart. Their heart, Jesus said, is far from me. He said, in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So their doctrine was made up. It was the commandments of men. It was not after the truth, the word of God, see. And so they failed in both areas. They did not worship God from the heart, they did not worship him in truth, that is, according to his word. Their worship was of the doctrine and commandments of men. Jesus said, in vain they do worship me. Now that word vain, friends, it means empty, void, useless. In other words, their worship to God was completely useless. And this should tell you and I this much that if we don't have both of these ingredients in spirit and in truth in our worship, whatever act we, we offer God, then God's not going to accept that and all of our worship is in vain. It's useless. Did you know that you can go to church all your life and if you're not there giving God what he asked for in his word or giving it from the heart, you have gone to church all your life for nothing. That worship is vain. It's empty. It's void. It's useless. Imagine going to church all your life and never worshiping God acceptably. And let me give you an example of how that could be done today. You know, the Lord demands that we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. 
every first day of the week, every Sunday. The early church broke bread. They had the Lord's Supper weekly. They did. We find that in Scripture. I'll read it to you toward the end of our study. And uh, many churches don't even offer the Lord's Supper weekly. Some of them offer it once a month. Some of them offer it once a quarter, every, every three months, four times a year. Some of them offer it once a year around Easter. Some of them don't have it at all. I grew up going to different churches that observed the Lord's Supper, different time intervals. And uh, I knew nothing about the Lord's Supper. They never taught on it. <clears throat> they never explained what it was all about. They just all of a sudden, one Sunday you went to church and poof, there was the Lord's Supper that Sunday when I hadn't seen it all year long. See? This is just how they did. That kind of worship is vain because they weren't giving God what he asked for and that's, that's to remember the body and the blood of Jesus every first day of the week. We eat the bread and we drink the fruit of the vine in remembrance of Jesus Christ every week. And churches just don't do this, all right? <clears throat> if I don't give God what he's asked for in his word, that's vain worship. I've left off what he wanted. See, I've just left it off. And uh, so if you attend a church like that, your worship's for nothing. And so many people don't check to see what God wants. <clears throat> they just go to a church of some kind and they assume that that church has figured it all out. But that church many times has not. And so different churches offer different things. <clears throat> and especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper. And so you just never know what you'll get depending on where you go. Friends, you can't offer God that kind of careless worship. Our worship must be carefully sought out in Scripture. We must find out what God wants and then give it to Him from our hearts. And if we don't do that, God's not going to accept it. That's vain worship, see. That's worshiping for nothing. Nothing. It's empty, void, useless. Now, you may not have known that until just now. Maybe it never dawned on you that God is that particular about worship. But in our study in part one, I took you back through Scripture and showed you that God's always been particular about how he's worshiped. I gave you three examples, and I picked the three different ages, <clears throat> Bible ages, that man's been on earth. I picked an example out of the, what we call the patriarchal age, the period between Adam and Moses, this period of 2,500 years from Adam to Mount Sinai when the law was given, is a period of 2,500 years when God spoke directly to the fathers to the patriarchs, and we call it the patriarchal age. And I gave you an example of God being particular during that age. And the example I gave you was Cain and Abel. And we been, went back to Genesis chapter 4, and we saw that Cain offered God an offering of the fruit of the ground, that Abel offered God a one-year-old lamb and the fat thereof, that God had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. God accepted Abel and rejected Cain. Because Cain, you see, substituted what he wanted. He did not give God the one-year-old lamb and the fat. That's what God wanted. God wanted an animal sacrifice. Cain offered fruit or vegetables, something that he had grown. Maybe it was the best he had, but it wasn't what God asked for. And we read in Hebrews 11 and verse 4, if you remember, <clears throat> by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel still speaks to us from the grave telling us that it makes a difference how we worship God. You see, he's a living, he's a, well, he was a living example. He's a, a dead example of that now. He speaks from the grave, but he still speaks. He being dead, yet speaketh. 
-hmm. And so we looked at that example under the age of the patriarchs. Now, the second age was the Mosaic Age. And I gave you an example. That Mosaic Age is about a 1,500-year period when Moses got the law at Mount Sinai till the time Jesus died on the cross, about 1,500 years. During that time, the law of Moses was in effect upon the Jews. <clears throat> and so I gave you an example under the law. And the example I gave you was Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. How they went to offer incense one day and they took strange fire into the tabernacle that God had not commanded them. God wanted them to get their fire from off the altar out in the courtyard. That was holy fire. They got it somewhere else. And because they went into that tabernacle and presumed to give something God that he had not commanded, there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. God burned them up right there in that tabernacle. And Aaron, their father, who was the high priest, had to drag their charred bodies out of that tabernacle and take them to burial. Moses was their uncle, the great lawgiver. They were priests. Their father was the high priest. Their uncle was Moses. But it didn't matter to God. He burned them up because, you see, they didn't worship him acceptably. They did not get the fire where he told them to get it. They offered a strange or a different fire than he commanded them not. God's always been particular. So I gave you Cain and Abel under the patriarchal age and Nadab and Abihu under the Mosaic age. Then I gave you under the Christian age. And this Christian age is from when Jesus died on the cross until his second coming. We're still in it right now. We've been in it nearly 2,000 years. I gave you the church at Corinth, how they had abused the Lord's Supper, turning the Lord's Supper into a common meal. They were not worshiping in spirit, that is, discerning the Lord's body. They were not worshiping in truth. They were, instead of eating the bread and the fruit of the vine, drinking it in remembrance of Christ, they were eating it to satisfy hunger and to satisfy thirst. And so it was for the wrong reason. They were not worshiping in spirit and in truth. And Paul said they were eating and drinking unworthily. That is in an unworthy manner. And he says the person that does that eats and drinks damnation to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. So we can eat the Lord's Supper and go to hell over it. That's what he's telling the church there at Corinth. And in telling them, he's telling us. So I gave you these three examples then of how God is particular about how he's worshipped and showed you that he's always been that way. If you think that you can carelessly, haphazardly just go worship God and offer anything that a particular church wants to offer, you need to consult scripture to see what God wants. And you need to go to the church, go to the place that offers God exactly what he's asked for. And uh, that's the only way you can know that your worship will be acceptable. Give him what he's commanded and do it from your heart. Worship in spirit and in truth. So we talked about those things. Now, next, we raise the question, has God ever commanded us to sing praises in our worship? And we answered that affirmatively. Yes. Yes, he has. I gave you Psalms 100 and verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. God commanded singing in the Old Testament. But he's commanded singing in the New Testament. In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So he's commanded singing also in the New Testament. So in the Old and the New Testament, singing was commanded. Then I raised another question. Has God ever, has he ever commanded singing, or excuse me, has he ever commanded instrumental music? 
And I answered that, yes, in the Old Testament he did. And it was not optional. In the Old Testament, you worshiped with instrumental music. In 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 25, the Bible says of, of David that uh, it says that he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. So the Lord commanded instrumental music in the Old Testament. It was not an option. And if you were going to worship God in spirit and in truth, the truth is you had to use instrumental music. That was part of the worship. Then I raised this question. Has God ever commanded instrumental music in the New Testament? And the answer to that question is no. The New Testament is completely silent on the use of instrumental music. It is nowhere commanded. And uh, there's no example. In fact, listen, friends, listen. No church ever used instrumental music until 600 years after Christ. Over 600 years. There was an organ given to a, a church and... Uh, this became the first use of instrumental music in a church service, 600 years after Christ. In other words, for 600 years, no Christian ever worshiped God with instrumental music. And then after 600, of course, the Catholic Church started to practice. And of course, when the Protestant Reformation occurred, the denominational churches that sprang up like Lutheran, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, etc., all adopted the practice of instrumental music because the Catholics had been using it and so they just borrowed it from them. And they kept on using it without any authority from Scripture. The New Testament is silent. And then I raised this third question. The New Testament is silent about instrumental music. Is, is New Testament silence important? And the answer is yes. Yes, it's quite important. And there's a reason. And so I took you back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. And we read where Jeremiah predicted that the Lord would make a new covenant, a new testament with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So not just the Old Testament, he would make a new testament. Then I took you to Hebrews chapter 8 where Jeremiah 31 is quoted there and shown to be fulfilled in the New Testament that the New Testament was given. So Jeremiah predicts that a New Testament will be made. Hebrews 8 shows that that's exactly what happened. Now there's a scripture in Hebrews 9 that I have talked to you about before that I want to talk about briefly again because it's one of the most important scriptures in the entire Bible. <clears throat> Friends, for years, I've been telling people that you cannot understand the Bible without understanding these three verses. Hebrews 8, verse 15, 16, and 17. I'm scar sorry, Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. And here's what that passage says. It speaks of wills and testaments. And it speaks of Jesus here. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, that is, where it's a force, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now Jesus is the testator of the New Testament. And um, it's his testament. It's the Lord's New Testament. It's the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And uh, he has made 
another testament in fulfillment of Jeremiah chapter 31 and of course Hebrews 8. And uh, that testament did not come into effect, however, until after the death of Jesus. Testaments never do. And I used an example of a will. I made out a will. I named a fellow named John Doe as my heir. And in this first will, I left him a house and furniture. Now, when would he get that house and furniture? Not until I die, because a will's never in effect until after the death of the testator. Jesus lived and died under the first testament. The Lord did not live under the New Testament because it couldn't come into effect until after his death. See that? So Jesus lived under the law of Moses. He kept the law. He wasn't under the New Testament like we are. That New Testament came into effect at his death, just like in this illustration. My will would come into effect after my death. But let's suppose I make a second will. And in this second will, I still name John Doe. Except in the second will, I take the house that was in the first will and I put it in the second. I leave that to John, just like I did in the first, because I wanted that house in it. But I leave the furniture behind that was in the first will, because I'm not giving John the furniture now. I've changed my mind. I will, however, give John my savings account. That was not in the first will, but I put it in the second will. And when I die, which one of these two wills will be in effect? It will be the second will. The last dated will is my last will and testament. That's the last known will that I have. All right, that'll come into effect at my death. Now, when my will is opened by the executors and John comes to inherit he might tell the executors, I want Pat's furniture. I saw a will where he had given me his furniture. And I want that. And they're going to tell John, you can't have it. Because although it was in that first will, it's not in the second. He left it out. And if it's left out of the second will, you can't have it. Only what's named in this second will is what you can have. Anything it's silent about, you can't have. He's left that all. So all you get, John, is his house and his savings account. You do not get the furniture that's been left behind. So what I did in my will, in these two wills, I brought over out of the first will what I wanted in the second will. That's the house. I left behind what I did not want in the second will. That's the furniture. And I made part of the second will something that never was part of the first will, that's the savings account. And when I die, this second will will come into effect. And it will set the first will aside and make it null and void. It's no longer effective. It's no longer valid. This second will is the only will that's in force. And it comes into effect after my death. It doesn't matter what the first will says or what it authorized what it gave John Doe, it will not give him that. It'll, all that John can have is what's specifically named in the second will. Do you understand that principle? Friends, God's done the same thing with you and I. The very same thing. And this is going to help us understand the use of instrumental music and whether it's acceptable to God today, whether it's something he wants today offered unto him. God has had more than one will with man. He has. God's had several covenants with man. And uh, this first will here was in effect for about 1,500 years. Now, it was only given to the Jews, only given to Israel. Us Gentiles never were under the first will. We never were under the Old Testament. We didn't have a priesthood. We didn't have a sacrificial system. We didn't have a tabernacle or a temple. We didn't have feast days. We never had the law of Moses. The Gentiles just simply had the law that they knew by nature, the law in the heart. And that's what governed them. 
the Jews were under a written law. Us Gentiles had no written law. And so this first will, however, was made null and void when the second will came into effect. And now God's people are now under this second will. That's the one that's binding today. Surely you understand that principle. God has had more than one will with man, but he's never had more than one in effect at the same time. And one will cannot be in effect while another will is. He cannot have more than one in effect at the same time because they'll contradict. The Old Testament will contradict the New Testament if you try to make both of them a force at the same time. Now, I'm not telling you that the Old Testament is no good. I'm just telling you it's not the law we live under today. But it has principles and things which teach us great lessons. And remember, I used some of them in talking about how particular God is about worship. We talked about Cain and Abel. We talked about Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. There are great lessons taught in the Old Testament. There are things that point us to Christ. There are types, uh, antitypes. There are shadows back there in substance in the New Testament. Things that point us to Jesus. And uh, the Old Testament, of course, leads us to Christ. And it has great value. <clears throat> it's just not the law that we're under today. And we need to understand that. Now, <clears throat> I want to look at these two testaments. Before the death of Christ, the Old Testament was in effect. After the death of Christ, the New Testament came into effect. And that set the First Testament aside. And unless what is in the Old Testament, this First Testament, is brought over into the New Testament, then it's not binding upon us today at all. Just like the furniture in my will, it was left behind. There are many things in the Old Testament that have been left behind. But a few things have been brought over. And they're named specifically in the New Testament. Let's look at some of these now. Under the Old Testament, they offered animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice. And you'll find that in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. Let's read. Because this seventh chapter of Leviticus gives the laws concerning offerings. And when you get down near the end of the chapter in verse 37, 38 of Leviticus 7, the Bible says this is the law of the burnt offering, of the meat offering, and of the sin offering, of the trespass offering, and of the consecrations, and of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, which the Lord commanded Moses in Mount Sinai, in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their oblations unto the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. We know that under the First Testament, they offered animal sacrifices. We know that specifically. All kinds of animals, bulls, goats, such things as this. But those animal sacrifices, you see, were not brought over into the New Testament. They've been left behind because... God didn't want animal sacrifices. Jesus is our sacrifice, isn't he? And we read in Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therein too perfect. <clears throat> For then <clears throat> not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Listen. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now friends, why is that the case? Why won't the blood of bulls and goats take sin away? 
Why did God not continue animal sacrifices? Because their blood will not take sin away. You see, blood is the life of the flesh. We have to have blood to live. Okay? And the blood of animals is not of equal value to the blood of humans. Blood is life. And the life of an animal is not equal to the life of a human. And so if I'm if I've got a penalty of, of against me for sin, and the wages of sin is what? It's death. See? If I sin, I gotta die. Now, either I die or somebody's got to die in my place, but an animal can't die in my place. Why? His blood, his life is not valuable enough. It doesn't fully pay the debt that I owe because his life is not valuable enough to pay for my life. And so I would be offering God a life that's not of equivalent value to mine. See? And that's not going to pay the sin that I owe because the penalty, the penalty is death. So Jesus shed his blood at the cross. Why? Because he is the divine son of God. And his blood, that is his life, is more valuable than all human life put together. And Jesus' blood sufficiently pays the debt. The Bible calls it precious blood. It's priceless. It's, it's without value. You can't put a value on the blood of Jesus. And so animal blood won't take away sin. The blood of Jesus will. Why? Because it's more valuable than my blood. It's more valuable than my life. Okay? Understand? Jesus' life is more valuable than my life. More valuable than your life. More, value, more valuable than the life of every human being that could ever be created. He is the Son of God, see? And that's just how it is. And so the blood of animals, animal sacrifice, was left behind. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Understand? And so it doesn't matter that they had that practice in the Old Testament. Just because they offered animals back then does not give you and I authority to offer them today. Why? Because the New Testament is silent about animal sacrifices. God does not want it. That blood cannot take away sin. See? He tells us that. And so it's not required in the New Testament. That's why we don't offer animals today, in case you've wondered. Secondly, under the Old Testament, <clears throat> under the law of Moses, under that First Testament, there were food laws, restrictions on what the Jews could eat, for example. Now, us Gentiles weren't under this, but the Jews were. Leviticus 11, and I want to read verses 1 through 12, but we'll stop and talk about them. Here's the law in Leviticus 11 regarding what an Israelite could eat. Jesus lived under this law himself. The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto, him, unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, these are the beasts which ye shall eat among all beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. Let me stop right there. In order for any animal to be eaten by a Jew, he had to have a parted hoof and he had to chew a cud. He said, nevertheless, verse 4, these shall you not eat, of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. And the hare, or the rabbit, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, the pig, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass 
shall you not touch. They are unclean to you. So you see, this is why the Jew couldn't eat pork. Because the swine parted the hoof, but he didn't chew the cud. And so he was unclean and they couldn't eat him. So Jesus never ate pork chops or ham or sausage or bacon or pork roast or any of those things. He could not eat swine, see, because he lived and died under this law. In verse 9 now, he talks about what's in the water, what's in the seas and the rivers. These shall you eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall you eat. <clears throat> all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, uh, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. So anything you would eat from the ocean or from rivers and streams and lakes, it had to have both fins and scales. Now I want you to think about a catfish for a moment. It's got fins, but it has no scales. It has skin, doesn't it? So you couldn't eat catfish. How many of you eat southern fried catfish or catfish? Well, quite a few of you. The Lord never did eat catfish. It would have been a sin. It would have violated the law of Moses. Because although the catfish has fins, it doesn't have scales. It was unclean. Anything in the water that a Jew would eat had to have scales and fins. And if it didn't have both, it was unclean. See? So that was just the law of Moses. Now that law is no longer in effect. You cannot go back to the food laws of the Old Testament. Now you can go back and, and eat those things if you want to. But you can't bind it on anybody else. They're not bound on anyone today. You see, those food laws were left behind. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 to 5 talks about what we can eat. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, listen, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Listen, <clears throat> for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. In other words, any creature that you can pray over and give God thanks, it's sanctified by that prayer and by the word of God. God will sanctify that. In other words, you can eat. You can eat catfish. You can eat pork. You can eat any creature of God that you can actually give thanks for and really mean that prayer. And so, you see, the law has changed, you see. And that law, just like in my will illustration, uh, that's just like the furniture. <clears throat> Those animal laws were left behind. You see, that's all been changed now. And so, the New Testament has come into effect. These laws were not brought over just because there were restrictions on food in the Old Testament does not mean that they're binding on anyone today. They're not. The laws changed. See that? So what the New Testament says 
makes a real difference. The silence of the New Testament about restricting foods makes a big difference. So every preacher of God is good and nothing to be refused, it seems. Now, under the Old Testament, they had prayer. I'll use an example of John the Baptist, uh, father. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. It came to that he was under the law because he was a priest. It came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So while the priest inside the temple offered incense to God, the people stood without praying. You see, incense was burned along with their prayer. And incense is always symbolized prayer, a sweet savor going up to God. See? Sweet smell. And that's what prayer is as it goes up to God. See? Very sweet to Him. Under the Old Testament, the First Testament, they had prayer. Now, we have prayer today, but not because it was part of the Old Testament, but because it's mentioned in the New Testament. You see, like the house in my will illustration, prayer was brought over. God still wants prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17 and 18, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So it's the will of God that in everything we give thanks. Prayer is authorized in the New Testament. Okay? And that's why we can pray today. Listen, if prayer were not authorized in the New Testament, we couldn't pray. We couldn't pray. There would be no authority to pray. We couldn't worship in truth because the Word of God does not, would not authorize it, but it does authorize it. And that's why we pray today. Not because they had it under the Old Testament, because it's under the New Testament. That Old Testament's been set aside when the New Testament came into effect and we get all of our authority out of the New Testament. Now, under the Old Testament, friends, they burned incense. And I just read you an example there in Luke 1. That's what Zacharias was doing in that priest office in Luke 1, verse 8 to 10. Let me read it. It came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So Zacharias went into the temple to burn incense. Okay, That's what his lot was to do. and He was in there for that purpose. Under the Old Testament, they burned incense. Now, we don't burn incense today, do we? The New Testament is silent about incense. And so, in uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 8, Paul said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So we pray under the laws of the New Testament without burning incense. You don't have to burn incense during an hour of prayer. We pray without incense. You see. The New Testament is silent. And if you try to bring incense out of the Old Testament because they had it then, you can bring anything else out of the Old that the New Testament is silent about. You open the door, you see. You open the door to bring other things. And that's why this is critical. That's why I wanted you to see the study done in this fashion, in this way. Under the Old Testament... They had singing. We read that uh, in the first part of our study. Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And so under the Old Testament, they had singing. Now we sing today under the New Testament. Why? Because it's authorized in the New Testament. 
not because they had it in the Old Testament, but like prayer, it's been brought over into the New. And it's been commanded. In Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19, the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's our authority for singing. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so singing is authorized in the New Testament. And friends, that's why we can sing. It doesn't matter that they had it in the old. After all, they burned incense back there. They had restrictions on food laws. They had animal sacrifices. But you see, all of those things have been left behind. And of course, singing is one of those things that's been brought over, just like prayer. Okay? And that's why we sing today. It's authorized in the New Testament. It's like the house in my two-wheel illustration. The house has been brought over. See, singing has been brought over. It's been made part of the second wheel because God still wants it. Okay? All right? Now, under the First Testament, the Old Testament, they had instrumental music. In fact, I showed you where it was commanded. I'll read that again from 2 Chronicles 29, verse 25. It was not an option. The Bible says, He set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. The commandment of the Lord by his prophets was the use of instrumental music. Under the Old Testament, it was not optional. And if you were going to worship God acceptably, you used instrumental music. It was the commandment of the Lord through the prophets, you see. And so they had instrumental music. Now, we don't have instrumental music in the New Testament. The New Testament is silent. The New Testament mentions singing. And it names the instrument we use as the heart. In Colossians 3 and 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so just as we pray under the New Testament laws without the burning of incense, we sing under the laws of the New Testament without the use of instrumental music. The New Testament is silent, <coughs> friends, silent on instrumental music. And if you start adding instrumental music to your worship today, you can burn incense. Why couldn't you? You see, by the authority that you bring instruments over, you could bring incense over. You could bring the restrictions on the food laws. You could bring animal sacrifice. When the New Testament is silent on something, we must respect the silence. We cannot give God something he has not commanded. It doesn't matter that he commanded it under the Old Testament. He commanded incense. He commanded animal sacrifice. He commanded the food law restrictions. Just because something's commanded in the Old Testament doesn't mean anything. It has to appear in the New Testament. And Instrumental music simply does it. The New Testament is silent about it. Now, under the First Testament, there was no Lord's Supper. No Lord's Supper. It was not intended. The church had not been established yet. Jesus would establish the Supper before he died. And of course, it would come into effect after his death on every first day of the week. And in Acts 20 and verse 7, we read this about the early church. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, every Sunday, 
the disciples came together to break bread every first day of the week. The early church broke bread. And so we have this example now to tell us how often we should take the Lord's Supper today, every first day of the week. Under the First Testament, there was no Lord's Supper. Just like in my will illustration, there was no savings account. See, there was furniture. But there was no savings account. But under the second will, there's a savings account. So now, under the New Testament, there's the Lord's Supper, which never was a part of the Old Testament. The Jews never did take it. Never was given to Israel as a law. But of course, it's in the New Testament, and so we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Every Sunday. So, friends, it's not so much that the instrument uh, is important, it's the principle by which we don't use the instrument. Because if you start using instrumental music, you've opened Pandora's box, you've opened a bottomless pit, you've opened up the Old Testament, to where you can bring anything out of it that the New Testament doesn't even mention. So since it doesn't mention instrumental music, if I use instrumental music, the New Testament doesn't mention incense. I could burn incense. By the same authority, I have instrumental music. Ever thought of that? See, there's no limit to what you could do. I could put restrictions on food laws. Because they're not mentioned in the New Testament either. I can offer animal sacrifice. But you see, that's not mentioned in the New Testament. You see, you open up the door for anything out of the Old Testament. Now, anything from the First Testament that's not mentioned in the New Testament could be used if you start using instrumental music. That's why this issue is important. It affects our worship. And friends, when we start offering God things that he's not commanded, that's what Nadab and Abihu did. They offered strange fire that he commanded them not. They went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. You see, that's what Cain did when he substituted fruit of the ground for a one-year-old lamb in the fat thereof. This is what the Corinthians did when they turned the Lord's Supper into a common meal. You see, because they weren't to eat the supper as a common meal. They did. The Lord had not commanded that. You cannot take something not found in the New Testament and start offering that to God and expect God to accept your worship. Now, I made a list for us of every scripture in the New Testament after Christ's death that mentions singing. I want to read these to you. Now remember, the translators could have translated this play, but they didn't. They translated it sang, singing, or sing. Listen. In Acts 16, 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises unto God, prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Here again, they sang. Romans 15 and 9, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this cause, I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. There again, singing's mentioned. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding also. There again, singing. Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. See, the melody is made in the heart, not on an instrument. The heart is the instrument. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There again, it's singing. Colossians 3.16.
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Here again, singing is mentioned, not playing. Hebrews 2.12 saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. There again it's singing, isn't it? James 5.13 Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Not play psalms. Let him sing psalms. See? So it's always singing that's mentioned. The New Testament is silent, completely silent about instrumental music. I've given you all these passages after the Lord's death here on earth. Uh, here on earth where singing is mentioned. Okay. Now, oftentimes people put up arguments about instrumental music and, you know, people have their own emotional reasoning about it. Some will say, well, it pleases our sense of hearing, and we like it. What's wrong with that? In other words, we like instrumental music. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. We, we like the sound of it. What's wrong with that, they ask. But the question is, what does God like? It doesn't matter what I like. See, friends, the truth is this. <clears throat> I love instrumental music. I do. Uh, remember the dueling banjos? I love to hear those banjos. I love Floyd Kramer on the piano. Chet Atkins on the guitar. I love good instrumental music, but I don't use it with religious music. I don't worship with instrumental music. You see. But I do enjoy it with secular songs. There's nothing wrong with instrumental music in that sense. But when we bring instrumental music into our worship, you see, then the issue becomes what does God want, not what do I like. You know, for my listening pleasure at home, that's quite a bit different than what we do in church. What does God want? And God in the New Testament is stone silent about instrumental music. Evidently, he does not want it. We have no authority. We could not worship in truth and offer the instrument to God. Number two, some will say, well, if the instrument's right in the home, it's right in the worship at church assemblies. But friends, that's just not a good argument at all. You know, at home, I don't know what you do, but I imagine you do quite a bit what I do. I put jelly on my bread at home. Would you put jelly on the communion bread in, in church? You do it at home. If we make the argument, well, look, it's if it's good enough to, to do it at home, we can do it in church. If it's right in the home, it's it's right in the worship of church assemblies. You can make that same argument about jelly on the communion bread. See? You could open up the door for any number of things. We wouldn't think of putting jelly on communion bread. The New Testament is silent about that. And we're satisfied that when the Lord's Supper was instituted, there was not jelly used on the bread because it's not about the flavor and the taste of the bread. The bread is a remembrance of the body of Jesus and his suffering in that body. And so jelly's got nothing to do with it. We wouldn't dare do that, but we do it at home. We do a lot of things at home that we can't do in a church service. Number three, God didn't say do not use such instruments. No. No, you don't read in the New Testament where he says do not use instrumental music. You don't read in the New Testament where he says do not burn incense. God doesn't have to say it that way. God specified singing. That's what he wants. And he specified the instrument, the heart. He said to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing and make melody in your heart. See, 
he specified what he wanted, and that was singing. And that excludes playing, see. It excludes it. Back when God told Noah to build the ark, he told Noah might be an ark of gopher wood. Now, he didn't tell Noah not to use oak. He did in a sense that he told him to use gopher. When he said make be an ark of gopher wood, that excluded any other wood. God didn't have to say, do not use elm, hickory, birch, maple, cedar, and name every wood in the world that he didn't want. He just said, build you an ark, build me an ark of gopher wood. Make be an ark of gopher wood. That excluded any other wood. When God said singing, that excludes other kinds of music like playing instruments. He just specifies what he wants. It's called the law of exclusion. See, And so the singing excludes anything else. Number four, well, somebody says, well, God didn't tell us not to use song books and notes, yet you use song books in church. How come you use song books? It doesn't say a word about using song books. Well, friends, a song book and notes are expedients in doing what's commanded, and that's singing. Now listen, whether I sing with a song book or whether I sing without a song book, I'm still singing. I haven't added anything to the worship. It's still singing. But the instrument is an expedient in doing what is not commanded, and that's playing. When I add an instrument, I'm doing something that God didn't command. And that's playing, see. That's playing. And that's different. The songbook and the notes doesn't add anything. It makes no noise. It, it's, just, it's just words and notes, a melody. You can sing with it. You can sing without it. And regardless, you're still singing. But when you're singing with an instrument... You're doing something in addition to singing and you're playing. And that's something that God is not commanded. See, the silence of the scripture has to be respected. I hope this study has helped you. I hope that uh, you understand now the principle. You see, the reason why we don't have instrumental music is far more important than the instrument itself. Because if you bring instrumental music out of the Old Testament into the New, you can bring incense or anything else in the Old Testament that's not mentioned in the New Testament. And you've opened the door for just dozens and perhaps hundreds of different things that can be done in the church that are not even authorized in the New Testament. And before long, we would be following the Old Testament and not the New Testament at all, see. So we have to respect the silence of the New Testament. When it is silent about instrumental music, it's obvious that God doesn't want it no more than he wants incense or anything else. Else he would have mentioned it. And he doesn't. So that's the study that we wanted to give you on instrumental music. Go back now, if you will. Look at the first part again if you need to and follow up with this second part. You can put both parts closely together now since we have them and you'll get a more complete, uh, concise study of the subject itself. And I hope, Ben and I hope sincerely that it'll help you. These are the things we wanted to bring you. So thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for being patient while we had our illness and were not able to be with you. We wanted to be here. We were here in in spirit, but we just couldn't be here in body. And you've been very patient and given us opportunity now to present this second part, and we thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. For those of you that will view this later and were not able to see it live tonight, we thank you for joining us also. And we thank all of you for your interest in these studies. Lord's will now Barring any more illness or difficulties or problems, it is our intention to be with you next Wednesday. If God permits, if the Lord wills, we will join you then. We'll be announcing our subject. Brother Miguel will be posting that on our website. 
probably next Tuesday, Tuesday evening, and you'll find the subject there in advance. And uh, we're thinking about talking about the unpardonable sin. What is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? And if you've ever wondered about that, what is the sin that God says he will not forgive? That Jesus says a man who blasphemes the Holy Spirit has never forgiveness in this world, neither in the world to come. And if you've ever wondered about that, we may talk about that, Lord willing, next week. Regardless, we hope that you will join us and we look forward to being with you. May it be a wonderful week ahead for you with God's richest blessings upon you. And as we leave you here tonight, may you have a pleasant good evening and may God richly bless you this evening. Thank you, friends, for joining us. Good night and may God bless. <laughs>